Well, my problem is always that I don't know very much about countries like Libya, Syria, and so on. I cannot follow every. I cannot become an expert in every country that is being mm -hmm. being under attack, whether it's Yugoslavia, Iraq, Somalia, uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Libya. I mean, people pretend to be experts in those countries, but I'm very uh, skeptical that anybody can be expert in all these situations. Mm -hmm. So I'm not claiming to know anything about this or know very much about the situation there. But my question is, of course, what does our intervention there, in what sense does our intervention there help? People, of course, claim there is an international community which should help the Syrian, but there is no such international community because we see that there is a conflict between the Russian and Chinese and the Americans and, and the French. The Ameri that's because what the American and the French call the international and the British call the international community is in fact a one-sided intervention policy in the internal affairs of other states in violation of the UN Charter in practice, or at least in spirit, I mean, uh, it depends one from case to case. But they have, uh, under the guise of human rights, they have simply decided that the UN Charter is uh, kaput and bankrupt, and we can uh, just dismiss it, and we can intervene whenever we decide mm -hmm. that it's uh, the human rights violation. That's what I don't agree with. I mean, even though we could think of situation where intervention might be necessary, maybe even humanitarian intervention, there is a question of who is going to intervene. You see? If Russia was to intervene in Bahrain, for example, to protect the population, there would be a world war. So in fact, if there is no world war, it's because Russia accepts not to intervene in Bahrain, although maybe Russians could find an interest in doing that and maybe they would uh, win and, uh, you know, in Bahrain. The, the, the majority Shiite in Bahrain might take power, be thankful to Russia, give oil to Russia or something, and become an ally of Russia, and that would suit Russia, but we cannot think of allowing such a policy. So, but on the other hand, the West thinks that because it represents human rights, has a right to intervene anywhere, and that's very destabilizing, because, you see, every minority or every rebel group every, anywhere will now, after Yugoslavia, basically after Kosovo, they will decide that if they can frame the issue not as a political issue or as a separatist issue or whatever, but they can frame it as a human rights issue, then they can get the West, the Western powers to come militarily at its, uh, to support it. And that's very destabilizing, I'm sorry. I mean, I think certain things should change, and I think things are changing in Syria as far as I can tell. They have dismantled the one-party state, they will have elections, whether well, the election will be fair or not, that's a... That's a question, but of course the elections have not been fair in the West uh, throughout the ages. I mean, it takes time, and it, building up a democracy takes time. And the question is whether we should do it by intervening violently through our bombing, or whether we should let the process evolve. I think we should let the process evolve. I mean, if we see the result in Iraq and in Libya and in Afghanistan, I don't think our bombing is doing any good. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. I mean, they, <laughs> where the, uh, the problem is, of course, you see, on the one hand, where there are no elections because it's a dictatorship, let's say, like in Libya and Syria, there was, okay, uh, then, of course, they want to overthrow the system violently. Although, I'm, it must be said that if you look at the history of Latin America, of Franco Spain, of Portugal with Salazar, the Greek colonel, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Indonesia and several African countries, you see that many countries have undergone a democratization mm -hmm. process without foreign intervention in an uh, internal way. So I found it a bit e extraordinary, this belief that in the case of Syria and Libya, such a democratization process could not be done internally, or in the case of Iraq and so on, and it has only to be done by external intervention and bombing. Okay? Mm -hmm. It should also be realized that <laughs> the, the the only thing we do, in fact, is bombing, because we don't even, we don't have troops, we don't have, in the colonial period there was a coherence, you could send troops, then you administer the country, then you develop it, you exploit it, but you develop it to some extent, I mean, there, there was a, a project which had some coherence, but now we don't have the troops, we don't want to send kids to die in foreign lands, and we don't, certainly Europeans don't want to do that, the Americans barely are barely able to do that, so the colonial period is over, but then we say, okay, let's go and bomb, because that's the only thing we can still do. 
Okay? And if the, a country builds up a sufficiently anti-aircraft defense system, a DCA, then we don't want to bomb them, and that's maybe the situation in Syria. So, I mean, there's something completely crazy to this interventionist policy. And of course, moreover, when there is a democracy, then we go in and buy one party. We give money to one party, which is called Democrat. I don't know why the others are not Democrats. The others are running in elections too. And, and uh, why are some parties Democrat and some not Democrat? Uh, they are simply subservient to the Western interest or not. I mean, this is just destroying democracy where it exists and bombing to produce it where it doesn't exist. I mean, this is absurd. And this is a policy which, I must say, is supported by the vast majority of human rights organizations of so-called Democrats and of so-called left, and I think it's absurd. What, okay, what I want to say is that the connection mm -hmm. between economics and imperialism or colonialism is complicated. And I think Marx, for example, re realized that. It has become over the years sort of more and more mechanical that you think that every imperialist move is due to economic interest. And that, I think, is not true. It's too complicated. Mm -hmm. I mean, wars don't occur all the time. If the mechanism of exploitation occurs all the time. I mean, there are people who own the means of production and they can extract labor from the workers. But whether it's good for them to go into a country and destroy it, for example, one example is Iran, you see? What e economic benefit could be possibly have from bombing Iran? I mean, we aren't going to reconstruct Iran. We don't bomb it just to reconstruct it. That's too simplistic. Some people reconstruct, but the people who want to bomb have other motivations. And it sort of sounds to me often like a conspiracy theory, saying that behind closed doors all these companies work to to get contracts and so on. I don't believe Halliburton, for example, it's not even in the Fortune 100 companies is running the show to get the war in Iraq. You see, people have there are lots of simplistic views, but it would be equally simplistic to say that the pro-Israel lobby is behind everything. Okay, that I've never I've never said that, but. If you speak of, for example, the continuation of the occupation of the occupied territories, the Judaization of Jerusalem and, and uh, all these things, then there is no economic interest for the United States to support that. Then there is no strategic interest for the United States to support that. They don't have bases in Israel. They have bases everywhere else, but not in Israel. Israel has never participated in the in American war by, by itself. The war in Lebanon was done by Israel and then supported by the Congress, but not ordered by the United States. And the war in Iraq, the two wars in Iraq were done by the United States without Israeli help, and in fact asking Israel not to intervene in order not to destroy their pro Arab coalition. So, uh, their, their Arab coalition. So, I mean, one has to analyze things very concretely mm -hmm. and not think it's a whole a conspiracy of the oil company or a whole Jewish conspiracy and so on. I don't believe in conspiracies. I'm looking at the facts one by one. Okay? There is a dynamics also which has taken over the West of human rights interventionism, which is neither pro-capitalist nor, I mean, where the Zionist lobby has played a role, but the human rights movement has been a sort of sidetracked, I would say, uh, which I'm not against the human rights per se, but I'm against the sidetracking of the human rights towards uh, war propaganda. And then, of course, there's also the, uh, the military-industrial complex, which is pushing towards more armament, and more armaments may mean sometimes more war. But I think the causes of war has to be case, it's one by there is no general formula that explains why war occurs. That's what I think. I'm just not. Mm -hmm. I'm a sci I'm an actual scientist, and you know there are people who've been uh, studying war, like somebody called Richardson, who was one of the founder of climatology and was a pacifist of World War One, and he has studied even statistically what were the causes of war, and he found that they are very complicated and they are not reduced to a single formula like demography mm -hmm. or class struggle or something like that. I mean, it's just not. If it, I mean, I don't think there is a theory of why war occurs, but I, I strongly object to simplistic views. The, you see, I, I don't know the situation there well enough to give an answer. I, I don't want to... What I do question is the wiseness of our policy of arming the opposition and uh, 
denying from the start the possibility of a political transition, which is obviously, you know, honestly or not honestly, but there is a political mm -hmm. process going on in the country, and I think there has to be one. I think China and Russia do support the political process, in fact, and I think we should uh, either cooperate with the rest of the world in supporting the political process or not intervene at all. But this whole idea that we're going to arm the rebels because the civilian population is being butchered by the tyrant and so on, that I don't believe that story. But I don't want to commit myself. I think there are sectarian tensions in Syria, but I don't know enough the situation to appreciate, for example, how much the grievance of the Sunnis who think they are oppressed by the Alawites and so on is true or false. That uh, I cannot comment on that. I don't want to comment mm -hmm. on the situation in Syria because I don't know enough. are the aggressors. Where do they aggress anybody? That's the funny thing. You see, even if you complain about the behavior mm -hmm. in Chechnya or Tibet, these are within their borders. I don't see any Chinese soldier abroad, for example. Mm -hmm. and the Russians have been home from Eastern Europe, so I don't know where they are aggressors. Again, I think it's very important that we make a distinction between internal affairs and external affairs if we are to preserve world peace, because there is no suggestion from the human rights crowd of how to preserve world peace in a world where everybody can intervene everywhere. If they like intervention, then they should tell me why Russia has no right to intervene in Bahrain, uh, to support the population against the tyrant. And if they want that, then they have to realize they're going to have a general war. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a, you see, law, I mean, the value of law, in my view, and that applies to free speech, applies to uh, foreign inter international law, etc. It's always to protect the weak against the strong. That's the value of law, OK? A lot of the left say, oh, but the bourgeois law, etc. Maybe the law is bourgeois, but the point is that it's better to have a law than no law at all. Otherwise, it's the brute power of the strongest against the weak. And international law has the value of limiting the power of the strong state versus the weak state, at least if it's respected, or if there is a citizen's movement in the powerful countries to limit the intervention, which doesn't exist anymore in the Western countries, because the Western population has too many other problems than... Uh, uh, these uh, war and peace issues and the uh, elite or the thinking people or the peace movement has been sort of corrupted by this humanitarian intervention ideology so there is no nerve in the mm -hmm. anti-war movement there are some individuals but there is no real organization that could mobilize people as they used to be during the missile crisis or previous period uh, to sort of fight against intervention and, and that's the that's basically the human rights ideology has just wiped out the whole notion of, you know, anti-serious, uh, mm -hmm. uh, anti-imperialism. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so there is not nobody even to denounce what's going on. I mean, to, you know, even even if you now challenge the war propaganda, you immediately call a revisionist or a negationist and a Holocaust denier and so on, and, and, and you can't even get, mm -hmm. at least in France, you can't get the word in edgewise. And that's a tragedy, because that's, of course, refers then to free speech, which is also something which is put in the wastebasket by yeah. the humanitarian, the human rights mm -hmm. people.